Amen. Amen. All right. The title of the sermon this evening is The Gap Theory in Light of the Bible. The Gap Theory in Light of the Bible. Now, there are a lot of people that would be considered independent fundamental Baptists that are very, very similar to us that are strong advocates. They are strong proponents of the Gap Theory and they believe that the Gap Theory is taught in the Bible. Well, the title of this sermon is The Gap Theory in Light of the Bible. Because I'm going to start the sermon off by being very blunt, you know, not speaking to you like a liberal or like I'm limp-wristed. The Gap Theory is heresy. Now, the Gap Theory is not damnable heresy. The Gap Theory is not, you know, I would not rank the Gap Theory as being, you know, some sort of extreme massive heresy. But it's heresy. It is a very bad teaching. It is a very evil teaching. And it is... And I'm going to get into this at the very end of the sermon, in my conclusion. What it does is, is it twists and it perverts and it, it, it uh, strangles out the simplicity of the Word of God. Because the Bible as a whole is a very simple book that is meant to be understood. And man oftentimes makes the Bible more complicated, unnecessarily. Now, there are parts of the Bible that are, that, that are just deep wisdom, that you have to study, that are hard to understand, right? But the Bible, by and large, is simple. The Bible is meant to be simple, especially for a Christian, a saved believer that has the Holy Spirit. It's meant to be understood. And I'm going to go through the teachings tonight of what the gap theory is. I'm going to explain to you first off uh, in the introduction portion or the preface of the sermon this evening what the gap theory is. And then I'm going to go through all of their points and I'm going to show you why they are unbiblical and why the gap theory is a non-scriptural teaching. It's not even close to what the Bible teaches. Now here we're going to begin in Genesis chapter number 1. And I want to read verses, let's just go right now, verses 1 through 8. And then I'm going to explain to you what the gap theory is once you see what the text actually says. So Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, the Bible reads, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Verse 8. <clears throat> and God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So we can see that Genesis chapter number 1 verses 1 through 8 is extremely easy to understand. And it's meant to be. A child can read this and understand it. Now, I'm going to give you... Um, Two, actually, two false doctrines quickly, because you may or may not have heard of this other one. Uh, the other teaching that perverts Genesis chapter number one in the creation story is the day-age theory. Now, as everyone here, I assume, has probably heard of the day-age theory. The day-age theory is the teaching that the days that we read about from, you know, in Genesis chapter number one and the seven days of creation, really technically six days of creation and one day of rest, is actually spanned throughout uh, millions of years. That actually each day represents millions and some people say hundreds of thousands and this varies depending upon how old you think the, the earth is, right? So that is the day-age theory and they of course believe a lot of it is allegorical because you can't take it literal if you actually believe that hey first it's you know uh, in the first million years it's just darkness, the second million years you start coming into issues when it gets to plants and things like that being created. So they, they try to put like an allegorical, metaphorical, make this all poetic and things like that because you can't take it literal at that point because they're already not taking it literal so why would they care? Okay, so that is not what I'm preaching about tonight. Just in case you've heard of these, I don't want you to confuse them in, their, in your mind while I'm preaching. So that is not what I'm preaching about. The day-age theory is also false, of course. The earth is, is 6,000 something years old and you know evolution is a fraud. And it's false and the Bible doesn't teach it at all. The, the theory that I am preaching against tonight and debunking, if you will, is the gap theory, right? And what the gap theory purports is that there is a gap 
in your Bible, a, a, a time gap between Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, and verse number 2. So they teach that there is a gap between verse 1 and 2 there. Now, some people teach that that gap is millions of years. And what they do is they also try to cram evolution in there. Now, at this point as well, I think it's a perfect time for me to go ahead and give you my reasoning on why this began, especially when you look at when it started, uh, the time period in which the gap theory started to be taught. And uh, I'm going to read to you the origins of it right now. The, the gap theory and the day-age theory, both of them are compromises with the wisdom of this world and they are compromises with science falsely so called. That's the purpose of the gap theory and that is the purpose of the day age theory. You know, uh, universities today, you know, scholastic or academic uh, universities and places of higher learning if you will, they teach, you know, and, and they teach it adamantly that the earth is millions of years old, don't they? They teach that, that the universe is billions of years old and that the earth, planet earth, is millions of years old and they scoff at you and mock at you and they would say that you are the biggest idiot in the world if you believe the world is 6,000 years old, wouldn't they? They would laugh you to scorn. They would mock you. They literally would. They would say you're ignorant, you're stupid, you're not educated. They would earnestly tell you that, right? Well, what has happened is Christians, you know, over time compromised and they tried to find a way out. And then also, of course, the, the, you know, the unsaved, those that aren't saved in the first place, they try to use the Bible and, and, and have one foot in the world, you know, but they want to have some sense of spirituality. People maybe that are confused, people that are very bad people, you know, different people fall into different categories, right? They, they have brought these teachings to the forefront to where they have become popular in modern Christianity today. To where if you go into you know, <clears throat> five Baptist churches, one or two out of five of those Baptist churches are going to believe probably in the gap theory. Literally. I would, I would say at least one out of five Baptist churches in the United States believe in the gap theory today. Now, the majority of independent fundamental Baptists that believe in the gap theory, they do not believe that there are millions of years with, between Genesis chapter 1, 1 and 1, 2. They believe that there are thousands of years. And the majority that believe this are people that follow the teachings of Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman was a big proponent for the gap theory. And let me say this as well. You know, I love Peter Ruckman. I learned a massive amount from Peter Ruckman. He was one of the very first people that I really, you know, hung on to and started learning the Bible from. I went to a church, you know, almost my entire life where a pastor behind the pulpit was a, an avid follower of Peter Ruckman. And he was a great man of God, a great soul winner, and I believe those same things about Peter Ruckman. I don't believe that anyone has done even close to what Peter Ruckman has done for the King James Bible. You have all these people sneering and looking up their nose at Peter Ruckman saying he's unsaved when the whole reason why they have a King James Bible in their hand today and they believe that it's perfect and pure and that it is inspired by God is that they were ultimately influenced by someone who was influenced by Peter Ruckman. And that person is Jack Hiles, by the way. You know, sorry, but Jack Hiles corrected the King James Bible I mean, almost his whole entire ministry. And then he says that he read one of Peter Ruckman's books and then dug more into, in, into his material and was converted to the teaching that the King James Bible is the perfect, inspired, pure Word of God. Amen. Now, and so I'm not, I don't want to just, you know, say, I'm not saying that Peter Ruckman's a devil. I'm not saying even that's stupidity. You know, that's terrible. I would never say that he's a great man of God that's done great things for God. I'm sure he was highly rewarded for a lot of things he did. He had mistakes, and this is one of them. And I don't care who it is and what great things they've done if they're teaching heresy they need to be called out on it if someone stands up and they've done great things and they're teaching something that is considered heresy and this is they need to have their name named the bible clearly you know talks about marking them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the things which you have learned so that's what i'm doing in this case and a lot of the people and i love a lot of these people i think they're saved i think they're doing great things for god but they're teaching heresy when they stand up and they teach the gap theory in genesis 1. A lot of the churches that you go into that will teach the gap theory, they will be Ruckmanite churches, followers of Peter Ruckman. They do not call it the, Ruck, the, the gap theory. Does anybody know what they call it? The gap fact. So they're so brazen 
and, and bolden about what they believe, they say it's not the gap theory, it is the gap fact, saying there is no doubt about this. Now let me say this, it's the exact opposite of that. It's not even a theory, it's 100% not true. It's without a doubt not the gap fact, it's the exact opposite. And I'm going to show you that from the Bible. I'm going, to te I'm going to show you, I'm going to go through the, thing, the verses that they use themselves, and I'm going to show you very clearly and very plainly that what they've done is they've, they, they take words, they misunderstand words, and I want this to, to stick out in your mind, the statement that I'm about to say. They have turned a, what is it, a, a, a mountain into a, or a molehill into a mountain? Which way does it go? I just lost that, that phrase. How does that go? Out of a molehill, right? Yeah, that's why I had it reversed. That's exactly what it was. They are making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, so it would be they turned a, a molehill into a mountain. I would have been saying it right. I knew there was something wrong about that. So they make a mountain out of a molehill. What they do is they take a small verse. They take a very small verse. They take words that they misunderstand. They take all of these small things that are not very specific, and then they try to blow them up. They try to make them real big, and they try to like hang their hat on things that are ambiguous but, but not even close to teaching what they say it's teaching or, or teaching what they claim that it's teaching. Now I'm going to read you real quick the origin of the gap theory. So it says this, although advocates of the theory claim to have, uh, have precedent in earlier writers, the view makes its modern appearance in the work of Scottish theologian Thomas Chalmers. And I've, I've verified this with a few different people that teach the gap theory and they all say hey I believe people taught it beforehand but this is the the earliest you know that we can actually find it in writing so this man's name is Thomas Chalmers he was a Scottish theologian he is the first person that we actually have you know uh, 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 that we actually have a manuscript or actually wouldn't even be a manuscript at this time but we actually have something in writing that he actually taught this Thomas Chalmers it was in 1814. So he proposed this as a theory in 1814. It's very, pretty recent. His view was popularized by the Plymouth Brethren writer G.H. Pimmer. In his book Earth's uh, Earliest Ages, so that's the name of it, Earliest Ages in 1876, Pimmer wrote, It is thus clear that the second verse of Genesis describes the earth as a ruin. But there is no hint of the time which elapsed between creation and this ruin. Age after age may have rolled away. Now I want you to pay close attention to this. And it was probably during their course that the strata of the earth's crust were gradually developed. You just found out the reason why people started teaching this in the first place. Do you notice what he just tried to do? He basically told you that... You know that gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that we believe in, that we teach? You know, hey, look how it looks like it's in ruin. Yeah, well, it would make perfect sense that during that time that that's where all of the geological layers in the earth came from. That's the reason why people try to teach this. And they have no other reason. I don't care what the universities think, whether they think I'm an idiot. The world is 6,000 years old. They think you're stupid anyways, buddy. They think you're dumb for believing that this book was written you know, by man who was inspired by God. They think you're a fool. The wisdom of God is foolishness with the world in the first place. Stop compromising with the world. They're the ones that are fools. They are the ones that are fools. They believe that the world came from nothing. They believed that there was nothing, no space, no time, no matter, and then there was a big bang. I mean, I don't know how to even explain that to you, but there was a big bang, no space, no time, no matter, and then gradually you have all the complexity in the universe that you see today. That is dumb and foolish. You are ignorant. Right. You are uneducated. Right. The only reason why people believe is for the hatred for God in the first place. That's why they believe in it. That's what drives them to believe in it. Yeah, people are indoctrinated, but the, the proponents of evolution and these teachings that that really, I mean, stand up there, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, look at every one of them, they hate God. Why do you think they believe? You think that's a coincidence? They hate the God of the Bible. They hate everything about the Bible. That's what it is. So don't try to compromise with them. They think you're a fool anyways. You might as well, obviously a Christian wouldn't do this, but you might as well just cast the whole Bible out in the first place then. Right. You, I mean, that's what you would have to do to compromise with them. What you need to do is just stand strong on the Word of God. Amen. You need to just believe, like it says, by faith we believe that by the Word of God the worlds were framed. 
Amen. That's what we need to do. We need to just believe what it says. Right? So it's clear by the man that actually popularized it, he tells you the reason why he believes it. He, t he flat out tells you. He explains to you. It would make perfect sense if we had this time period that this is where all these geological layers came from. Well, I actually believe, believe that Genesis chapter number 6 through Genesis chapter number 10 was a real event. I believe that Noah's flood was a real event and there are scientific principles such as hydrologic sorting that actually explain those geological layers instead of your hypothesis that millions of years take, you know, uh, it takes millions of years to create these layers. You can't even test that. You don't even know that's how those layers would form, fool. But there is a real scientific principle that tells you hydrologic sorting, that things that, that are different mass that they will sort based upon their density. This is something that is testable, observable, that's real science. You know, you know, uh, uh, you know just standing there and, and just basically making up a hypothesis about, hey, I think that these are all millions, there's all different ways to, to, to debunk it. Of course, by the strata, the trees and stuff that go straight through these layers and conjoin these layers, trees standing up through them. I mean, it, 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 it can be debunked by real science, right? So we don't, we don't need to compromise the Bible. Their science is foolishness. And even in light, just looking at their science, you can debunk what they're teaching, right? So that's the reason why people teach it, because they're compromisers. That's what it is. You, are either, you have either been duped by someone and, and, and taught this and deceived by them, and that's why you believe it, or you yourself are a compromiser. One of the two. Because the Bible doesn't teach it. Either someone has taught you this and really firmly got, you know, gotten you to believe this when it's not true, or you at one point compromise because it's easier to say, hey, dinosaurs, gap. I can't explain it. Look at the gap. Oh, it, you know, all these, all the strata, all the layers, you know, there's a gap. I can explain that. There's a gap. You know, if you, if you didn't notice there, it's, Gen it's Genesis chapter 1. Now we're going to get into the sermon here. I'm going to give you my, my first point here. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and what comes after verse 1? Verse 2. Verse two. Is there a verse 1 and a half? No. So this is their primary text, isn't it? Because they believe that the gap takes place where? Between Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, and verse number 2. There is no commentary between those two verses. There is no verse one and a half. There is no verse one point, you know, seven five. It goes straight from Genesis chapter one, verse one to verse two. So you believe something takes place in Scripture in a verse that does not exist in the Bible. Now I don't use this word very often, but it's very applicable right now. Exegesis, right? People know what the word exegesis means. Eggs means like to take out of, like exit. Exegesis refers to the fact of when you're interpreting Scripture, you're trying to understand Scripture, that you are getting the, your interpretation from the text itself, out of the text itself. That's what exegesis means. The opposite of that, the contrast to that, these are theological terms when it comes to studying the Bible, is eisegesis, right? Eisegesis means that you are taking something, it's the exact opposite, and putting it into the text. They are trying to insert verse one and a half in between these verses. They are trying to insert something in between verses one and two that is not there. This is their main text. They believe that it takes place in Genesis 1. So let me say this from the very beginning. Their basis is a verse that does not exist. Their basis is a verse that is not in the Bible at all. That is a major point. Whether you understand that or not, that is a major point. Any other verse is a supporting text. This is their proof text. Genesis chapter 1 and a half. Chapter 1, verse 1 and a half. That's their proof text. It's not there. They have nothing. Now, I'm going to prove to you just from the basic reading quickly, show you why. In this chapter itself, we're going to read down a little bit again. And we're going to see the natural reading of the text, the obvious reading of the text, without any preconceived ideas or presuppositions, is that it's Genesis 1, 1, and then Genesis 1, 2. And it's very simple to understand. I may even experiment and have a child that just learned how to read come up and explain this to me in just a moment. 
Genesis chapter number one, verse number one says this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now they believe the gap takes place right there. Right there. Thousands of years went by. Look at verse number two. And the earth was without form and void. So we just, you know what just took place? Time out. Genesis chapter number one, according to them, Genesis chapter number one, verse number one, we read that, and then you know what happened? Thousands of years. You got that, didn't you, Brother Hall? <laughs> you got that from the text. Did anybody else get that from the text? It's ridiculous. Amen. It's foolish when you really try to apply it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. Now, does anyone grammatically know what a conjunction is? I like grammar. I point out grammar a lot because it's important when you're reading words, right, in the Bible. What is a conjunction? It, it is a word that joins together two clauses, right? Most of the time it's used to join clause, clauses. It can also be to join, you know, thoughts, ideas, phrases is really the technical term, right? So... Right here, notice verse number 2 says, and. So if we started like a whole new thought about thousands of years later, now he's going to start speaking in regards to thousands of years afterwards, or are we talking about the same thing? No, we're talking about the same thing, aren't we? So it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then it says this, and at that same time, when he created the heaven and the earth, right? The earth was without form and void. So what is he describing at this point, at this moment? He's describing what he just created, the heaven and the earth. And then it says this, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's referring to the waters, of course. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So when he created the earth there, it describes the earth, and it says that it is without form and void. Now, the true interpretation of this is that he created the earth and it was not yet complete. Gap theory people love to mock at that. But that's what it's teaching. Now, because what they do is, and we're going to go to a passage here, we're going to come back to Genesis chapter number 1. They, they try to, uh, uh, what they try to do is they, they try to compare a scripture with this that use similar phraseology and similar wording with this passage and they try to make them the exact same meaning when it is not. Now, a, the word form, right? just refers to the fashion of something or the shape of something. Now, when here it says it is without form, what is it describing? There, there are no mountains yet, are there? Right? There's no dry land, right? So, what really, I want you to you know, answer this question to me. If we look at the earth, right, and we're not talking about a flat earth, we're talking about a round earth, we look at the earth and we see where we get the, sh where, where the earth really has its shape. Where, where do we really have things protruding out? Where is it? From what, really? From the dry land. Is there dry land present? So, wouldn't it make perfect sense? Because if not, the dry land is not there at this time, that it would be without form. Without its form, its natural form of, of going on into the world, right? The, the time of history. Wouldn't that make perfect sense that that's the form that he'd be referring to? Because it's without form saying, I'm going to add the form to it later. And then we have mountains, we have ranges, we have hills, we have valleys, we have dips, we have crevices, all different types of things. Dales, which would be similar to a valley, brooks, different water, creeks, not only oceans, right? Rivers, all these things. It adds form to the earth. Ditches, right? So right now it's without form. You know why? Because it's just water. That's it. So you created the heaven, that space, and earth, that's just the earth with just water. There's no dry land at all. That's how God decided he wanted to create the earth in the very beginning. You know what he said it was? It was without form. And then he says this, void. What does void mean? Empty. You know, the, the uh, uh, successive verses, the following verses that we're about to read in the following days of what takes place in creation is God adding things to earth. Right? So right now it is void because God is, is yet to create the, the creeping animals. He's, he's yet to create the, the, the aquatic marine life and animals, right? All of those things. He hasn't created the trees yet, the plants yet. What is it? What would you, how would you describe the earth at this point? Void. It's empty. It doesn't have, it's not full, is it? It doesn't have life on it yet. See so you know what it is? It's without form. Because there's no dry land to create all of the, the ditches, the mountains, as I said. And it's also void. Now, could that phrase, without form and void, be used to describe something? Let's say, let's say if, if something has been destroyed. 
Could you also use that phrase to say, hey, that's without form and it's void. Let's say this church today, this building was full, it has form to it, right? And let's say that a bulldozer went through here and just tore down this entire building. Couldn't I say that now this land right here, this area, where this building is, now is without form and void? You could use that. It'd be, an, it'd be an unorthodox way to use form there, but it doesn't have the same form. It's without form and it's void. It's empty of what was there, right? So you could use that to describe ruin and destruction. So <clears throat> what they try to teach in Genesis chapter number one, gap theorists, is in Genesis chapter number one, in between verse number one and verse number two, is that there was, that there was a world created. That's a complete creation in verse number one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's saying, they, they say that that's done. That's the first creation of earth. Right? Heaven and earth. It's totally complete. And they believe that there was, and I'm going to go to the verses that they teach about this. This is becoming relevant now. They believe that there was a pre-Adamic civilization at this time. A civilization before Adam or man, you know, kind and Adam himself, the head of man, was created and put on earth. A pre-Adamic civilization that was on earth at that time. And they believe that that earth, because of sinfulness, you know, became destroyed and was ruined. And, and, was and, you know, that, and that's what this is talking about when it says, and the earth was without form and void. So, you're supposed to understand from Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that the whole earth was created. He's totally complete. You know, uh, uh, they believe angels fell and came down to the earth. They lived on the earth. All these things happened for thousands of years. They were wicked. God destroyed them. And then verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. That makes the Bible foolish, my friend. That makes the Bible stupid. It makes it, under, it, makes it you know, just not understandable. To the point where it's, it, you can't understand it. Right? It's silly. The Bible says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. That, that is not taught here. You're trying to add unto his words. I want you to go with me to Jeremiah chapter number 4. We're going to see where they get this without form and void. This is in Jeremiah chapter number 4. Jeremiah chapter number 4. <clears throat> I want you to look with me at verse number 23. He says this, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. And then he says, and the heavens, and they had no light. And they're like, man, look at all the similarities. It must be talking about Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1. Without form and void, and there was no light. I would... You know, one thing that I would like to do before we jump to these conclusions is I would like to read the context and see what is being spoken of in the surrounding passages, shall we? Amen. Okay, so that's verse number 23, right? But let's back up to verse number 19. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard. O oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. So it sounds like, you know, there's a war getting ready to happen now. Verse 20. Destruction upon destruction is cried. Notice that. Destruction. Then it says this. Oh my, uh, or I'm sorry. Whose land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Then he says, verse 22. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish. That means stupid. Children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Verse 23, same context. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Why is it without form and void? What's going on? Just explain to you that there was destruction. Things were being destroyed. There was destruction. Keep, keep reading. Let's see what it says next. <clears throat> and they had no light. Verse 24, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled and all the hills moved lightly. Notice what are present. Mountains. Do you know what had not yet been created in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1? Dry land. Was not present. Look at verse number 26. I beheld and lo, the fruitful place, watch this, was a wilderness. That right there is your key. What happened? Why is it without form and void? He says, destruction upon destruction is cried, verse number 20. Then he tells you there in verse number 
26, I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Watch verse 27. For thus hath the Lord said, the whole land, watch this, shall be desolate. Notice that. What is that? Empty. That's void. Without form and void. He's saying he's going to destroy the whole place. Now is that hard to understand? Very simple. Why is there no light? Oftentimes when God comes and brings destruction, you know, the day of the Lord is going to come where he's going to literally block out the light, right? Where it's going to, the sun and moon are going to go, are going to be darkened. But God talks about that happening even in the book of Joel at their time. You know, that's what's going on in this type of situation. It's a dark day. God brings storms and things like that. It's not that difficult to understand. Read every time God's destruction, God's fierce anger comes upon the nation of Israel. They talk about it being a dark day all the time. That's not, that's not a strong proof at all. In the context, this is foolish. It really is. It's silly and it's foolish. Once you go back to Genesis chapter number 1. So all you have to do there is read the context. Now, because this, this, this teaching is just a compromised view, it's not that someone misunderstood a hard passage. <coughs> It's that someone tried to create, like I said, a mountain out of a molehill. They tried to create a doctrine to compromise the Bible with. So therefore they had to just make something up that's not there. And that's what's happened here. So they have to reach. They have to try to you know, compare things, find whatever they can, you know, not let you read the context, and then also rip things out of context right here. Now, furthermore, I want you to look at verse, uh, verse number 1, verse number 2 again in Genesis chapter 1. It says this, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And it says this, And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So what, where, where is the darkness at right now? It's upon the face of the deep, all of the earth. Why? Because there's no light yet. Look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, do you see the very simple continuity between Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, through verse number 3? Very simple, very easy. God creates the heaven and the earth, and then he explains the heaven and the earth, has no form and void, and it, there's darkness. Right there. And then verse 3, it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Where did the light, uh, what was the light shining upon? Obviously, the earth, where there was darkness. That's very simple to under, it's, it, it's extremely easy. There's perfect continuity. Look at verse number four. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Now verse five, this is very important. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now watch this. And the evening and the morning were what? We're the first day. This is game over already. This is the first day. You say there were thousands of what that took place between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2? Thousands of what? Thousands of days? Game over. That, doc, that false doctrine is just thrown right in the trash can by verse number 5. Right there in the beginning. Heaven and earth. It's without form and void. Darkness is upon the face of the deep. God creates light. He divides the light from the darkness. And it says, the evening and the morning were the first day. Calls the light day. The darkness he calls night. The evening and the morning were the first day. First day when? Ever. The first day ever. What do you, what do you mean? First day when? I mean, goodness sakes. It's simple. Now, to further prove this, I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter number 2. Verse number 1. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 1. Sometimes these, these chapters are, 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 are divided too much in your mind. Obviously, they're not. The, the, the original writers did not write down. You know, Moses, you know, Moses, when he wrote down Genesis 1, he didn't go chapter 2 and then thus the heavens, right? This, these were added by the King James Bible translators, of course, and you know, they were there previous to that, actually, but King James Bible translators continued with this tradition to help you. They benefit, but they're not inspired scripture. That's my point. So you need to, uh, you know, let there be continuity from the end of, you know, Genesis 1, verse 31 to chapter 2, verse 1. Watch what it says this. After it, it describes creation, watch what it says this. Thus, what does that mean? In this way, right? The way I just explained to you. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Do you know what that is? 
That's a finality verse. That's an encapsulating verse saying, what I just explained to you, that was creation. And that's how the heavens and the earth were created. Very simple. It's very simple to understand. I'm going to further prove this to you, and this is also just case closed. Go to Exodus chapter number 20. We're going to go to the simple verses in the beginning here just to prove that this was a seven literal day uh, thing that went by. Six days of actual creation and then a seventh day where God rested. Here in Exodus chapter number 20, this is, this is really the... the, the um, this is the, the, the final uh, blow, if you will. That's what I would say. This is the final blow. This is its game over. It's, it's extremely clear. Look at Exodus chapter number 20. Look at verse number 10. <clears throat> Look at verse 9 first. Six days shalt thou labor. This is, of course, the Ten Commandments, God commanding the Israelites. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now he's going to tell you why. Verse 11. For, that means because. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And then he says this. And rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hollowed it. Now if you remember back... In Genesis chapter number 1 and Genesis chapter number 2, where that actually takes place as far as him blessing the Sabbath day and hollowing it, that is in chapter number 2. So it tells you very plainly here in Exodus chapter number 20 that in six days the Lord thy God made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And then he says, and rested the seventh day. Now what is he comparing this unto? He's comparing it unto your seven-day work week. Now, are there these large gaps between seven days and a week? No, they're just simply seven successive days. One after the next, after the next, after the next. And he's saying this. You, just like I did, right? You, Israelite, just like God did, are going to work six days in a row. But then on the seventh day, I want you to rest. Why? Why? Because that's what I did. I worked for six days in a row. That's what the Israelites are going to do, right? And then once I was finished working, that is creating the earth in those six days, I rested on the seventh day. So how many days did it take to create the earth? Six. Now, is there a big gap between day one and two? Or are they one through seven just right at one after the other? Simple, isn't it? It's very easy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we learn something there when we see the figure between our seven day work week, why we have or six day work week and then the, the Sabbath day, seven day week. We learn something by comparing, by God comparing the seven days of creation to that, don't we? We can see that there's a parallel here. And it's that it took six days to create the earth. God created the earth in six days. Again, gap theory debunked. It's that simple and it's that easy. You may think this is boring. Well, it's that stupid of a theory. It's that dumb and that bad of a theory. The Bible just doesn't teach it, my friend. It's very easy just by a simple reading of Genesis 1. I could have got a child to come up here and explain Genesis chapter number 1 to me. I could have easily. Does A.J. read? He better not let me down. A.J., come here. Come here real quick, AJ. He's probably listening, so it's a little unfair. I want you to read to me Genesis chapter number 1 and explain to me. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Explain? Explain to me. Just briefly, very easily. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there is light. What just happened from the beginning to the end? First God made the earth, and then... Um, and then what did He do? So first He created the heaven and the earth, and then was, what was the very next thing immediately after that that took place? If you need to look at it again, you can look at it again. Right, the earth was without form and void, right? And then what took place immediately after that? There was light. 
there was light. Now, did a long period of time go by or did, did God create the earth and then God create light? No, no what? No. Not a long period of time? Just immediately, right? Is that simple to understand? Is that easy to understand? It makes sense? All right, thank you. Very, very easy to understand, right? Even for a child, right? It's simple. It's simple. Now, I'm sure if he was seated next to, you know, his parents and he, instead of in front of 50 people and not ready to be called up here and I allowed him to explain it, he would explain that very simply and very easy. You know why? Because he understands it. All the children here understand what that's teaching. No, a lot of time did not go by. Do you know what AJ believes when he he hears that read? He believes that God created the heaven and the earth. The supreme creator, the God of all, created the heaven and the earth. And you know what AJ believes took place immediately thereafter? That at that time there was darkness and what he created, there was, it was form, without form and void. But then God spoke. And God said immediately after that, let there be light. And there was light. AJ, do you believe that time was, went between a large gap where people lived on the earth? Yeah. You don't believe that, do you? You think that's when dinosaurs lived? Do you, do you learn that from Genesis chapter number one and a half, chapter one, verse one and a half? There is no one and a half, is there? It's not in the Bible. It's not there, my friend. You say, you know, this sermon seems so simple. It's that easy to debunk. There's nothing to attack because it's not in the Bible. All you have to point out is that what they've done is they've just created a doctrine that's just not in the Bible. It's just not there. Now I'm going to go through the other passages that they use, you know, uh, outside of what we've seen already, where they try to just take without form and void and then there being no light and say, ha, that's Genesis 1. That's foolish. That's ridiculous. Read the context. I can debunk that easily. I can show you and explain to you what Jeremiah chapter number 4 is teaching. I want you to go with me now to... Romans chapter number 5. I'm going to show you a couple of holes in their theory. Romans chapter number 5 because what they believe that took place during this period of time is that there was another civilization that lived upon the earth and that God destroyed that civilization. Now if he destroyed them and these are beings, what did he do? What would have happened to each of these beings? They would have what? Died, right? Well, I want you to look at Romans chapter number 5 verse number 12. It says this, Wherefore is by one man, watch this, sin entered into the world. And then it says this, And death by sin. Notice that? It says, Wherefore is by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. When did death enter into the world? And who was that speaking about? I mean, we don't have, you know, obviously they struggle with the context, but it's Adam. Adam was the first man that sinned. And when he sinned, Adam brought what into the world? Death. death. Do you know what that means? Death did not exist before Adam sinned. Amen. Therefore, there was no civilization that was destroyed where a bunch of people died on the earth. Game over again. It's very simple. That is how easy it is to, de to defeat these foolish doctrines, these stupid doctrines. You know, just believe the Bible. Stop being a compromiser. Just believe what the Bible teaches. Amen. There was no death before Adam. Therefore, there was no you know, pre-Adamic civilization where people died and were destroyed. Game over. I want you to turn with me now. We're going to look at a couple other points. We're going to look at some of their passages as well. <clears throat> uh, I want you to go... You go to uh, 2 Peter chapter number 3. One of the other passages I've heard. I actually you know, uh, was taught this. I didn't believe it when I was taught it. But I was taught this... Um, when I heard the gap theory being taught. <clears throat> That's one of the other things I wanted to point out to you as well. From, I don't want you to have to turn there, is why I'm turning there. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 1. Uh, first I'll read to you Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 31. It says this, And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was, listen to this, very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God created the earth, and it was perfect. God created the earth and it was literally paradise. What Adam and Eve were living in was paradise. And it, it is almost identical. And there are so many different parallels to that and heaven. What is in heaven, which is New Jerusalem, which will come down to this earth again. So, God did not create an earth and then it was destroyed and then he restored that earth 
back to paradise and then he's going to destroy it again and then he's going to return it back to paradise again. That's foolish. That's very foolish. The Bible teaches that God created the earth one time. It was perfect. It was very good. And then sin entered into the world. So before sin had entered into the world, prior to that, do you know what it was? It was very good. It was very good. You know what it was? It was paradise. There weren't people being destroyed. There was no death. It was very good. That's why it says in chapter 2, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. They were done. They were finished. God started His work on day one, and it took six days. And you know what happened? He created the earth in six days, and then He rested on the seventh day. That's why chapter 2, verse 1 says this about the six days, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Saying what? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That's important. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 31. Thus the heavens were finished. You know what's going on in that time period? I'm going to summarize for you chapter 1. You know what it is? God creating the earth. All of it. That's it. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. They mocked the, 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 the verse. And this is one thing I've heard Gene Kim do. He's a complete idiot. Gene Kim is the biggest moron in the world. And I hope you never. He's like got a lot of followers on YouTube. Don't listen to any of his videos. He's a complete idiot. Amen. Total moron. Gene Kim is like, <clears throat> these gap theory people, you know, they look at Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 and they say, this is just describing an incomplete earth. You know how he mocks everything. <laughs> that's how he laughs. If you know what I'm talking about, you know why that's funny. He, you know, and he, he, he is always, he's always, I heard him say like three or four times in one of the videos I watched this week. He's like, you know, uh, these, these uh, um, not gap theorists, no, these people that, you know, deny the gap, right? These people that deny the gap, they look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, and they say, well, that's just the description of an incomplete earth. And he mocks that and ridicules that. So you have all of chapter 1, and then you have chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Do you know what that means? Was not prior to that? It wasn't finished. It wasn't complete. Right. Yeah, so maybe it's an incomplete earth, Gene Kim. You fool. Goodness sakes. You know what that means? Everything in chapter 1 was incomplete. Including Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. It was incomplete. It was without form and void. But then it was finished. And then you know what it was? It had form and it, had, it wasn't void any longer. God put fowls in it. God put people in it. It's, it's, it wasn't like, you know, it, there was people there. There were people living there. It had form, right? And it was no longer void. Where did I have you turn? 2 Peter. 2 Peter. I want you to look at 2 Peter. So this is one of the passages that, that I was taught this by. 2 Peter chapter number 3. <clears throat> I want you to look at verse number 4. 2 Peter chapter number 3 verse number 4. It says this. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of, of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, it says this, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And then it says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, what is this talking about? I want an answer from a lot of people here. Heads of the households. Rick, don't just say what Brother Hall said. Tell me what you said. No, I'm just kidding. What, what is it, Brother Elliot? Brother Elliot? You're not sure? I missed it. Okay. We're just reading the passage there where it says, Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved under, under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What judgment is it talking about of the world? So, not the first part about the flood. You're talking about the coming... About, it's about the flood. You answered my question. Right. It's, the, it's, of course, the judgment of the flood, right? It's talking about the judgment of the flood. Every, isn't that very simple to understand? Well, people that are proponents of the gap theory. I don't know if you know this or not, but people that are proponents of the gap theory teach that this is talking about... You know, it, they say, this is what they say, that this had to be a completely different earth. Because notice it says, the world that then was 
being overflowed. Isn't that the wording that it uses? I'm quoting this from mine, but I'm not looking at it. Being overflowed with water, perished. Then it says this, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man. Now, one of these misunderstandings comes from the fact, and I've preached this here before, about what, you know, what the new heavens and new earth are going to be, what I believe that it is, and I think it's clear from Scripture. A lot of people teach that the new heavens and new earth is completely new. Like God actually creates new heavens and he creates a totally new earth. You know, they would say that the earth that we're on today and the heavens that exist today, the sky and everything, that they are going to be annihilated, cease to exist entirely, and then God creates new heavens and new earth in that sense. That's not true. Amen. And that's not what the Bible teaches. So just like our bodies now will be changed, right? The Bible talks about how the earth will be changed. Now he's going to fold it up and change it. Right? It says that we are a new creature. That's why it says in Romans chapter number 8 that the earth and everything in it groans, waiting for the adoption. That's talking about you and the earth. Why? Because God's going to restore everything. He's going to use what's here. He's going to use your body now. You know, you're going to take your last breath and die. That body will lie in the grave while your soul goes to heaven. And that same body, God will change and will make new. God will do the same thing with the earth. That's how he's going to do everything when he makes it new. There is not going to be a completely new earth as in a completely new creation. God is going to take what he has already created. He is going to reform it and make it perfect again or make it new again. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's where their misunderstanding comes away with because they think, well, see, this is the world that then was. You know, it's just like saying when I have my new body, I could talk about my body that then was. Right? I could say that, couldn't I? Which, it's technically the same body. But I'm a new creature. I have a new body. Does that make sense? Well, he's talking about the world that then was because God completely destroyed the earth in a very catastrophic way where it changed the face you know, of the entire earth. He dramatically changed the look of the earth. That's why it says the earth that then was. And I'm going to prove that to you. Number one, I think it's very obvious when he says, it says that it was destroyed by water. Where are we taught that the world was destroyed by water? The flood. Isn't that very simple? It, it was, they perished, right? Um, then it goes on to say, uh, uh, so verse number six, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now I'm going to prove that to you. I want you to go to uh, 2 Peter chapter number 2. It's just right before that. 2 Peter chapter number 2 verse number 5. I actually found this verse on my own uh, a few weeks after I had heard uh, 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 you know, uh, someone teach from the pulpit from 2 Peter 3 what I just told you. That this was actually, this is actually referring to a judgment. It's a completely different world. I want you to look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5. I want you to notice how this is, this is debunked by that. Look at verse 5, <clears throat> 2 Peter 2. And spared not the old world, but watch this, but saved Noah the eighth person, a, per, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. You notice that? He said he saved not the what? The old world. The world that then was. He saved not the old world. So that also is a further point to prove that the new world, the new heavens and the new earth, they can be called a new earth without being totally annihilated and then recreated. Why? Because this now is technically a new earth compared to the old earth or the old world that God had once destroyed. So God is going to destroy this earth with fire and it, it will be then a new earth just like he destroyed it with water, right? And it is a new earth because it's considered an old earth. If, if, if what was present on this planet prior to us today and prior to that water is considered old, then today is what's new and then there will be another new earth afterwards. Does that make sense to everyone? So here, notice what that old earth is. What is it? What is that judgment? It's as plain as the nose on your face, isn't it? So that old earth is not talking about some other world that was created in Genesis chapter number 1 and then existed through a thousand year gap. And then Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 2, is then the you know when God restarts to recreate the earth again. No, that's not what it's talking about at all. Notice how these are easily debunked, each one of them, right? So once more, 
And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And then look at the end of that. Bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Notice that flood. The earth standing out of the water and in the water at the same time. I want you now to turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. We're going to fly through the rest of these. Go to Hebrews chapter number 1. The pre-Adamic civilization... I'm going to be focusing on this the next three scriptures we turn to. We're going to fly through these. The pre-Adamic civilization is supposedly of fallen angels. Supposedly it is of fallen angels. So this would be them teaching that thousands of years went by, that God in Genesis chapter number 1 created the first earth and then created angels and then thousands of years went by. And then he made the earth that now is, which is a totally different earth, right? And then he, you know, he then... Uh, um, made man upon the earth. So then there's a new civilization at that point, right? Well, that may, I'm going to show you a reason why that makes no sense according to the Bible. Look at the purpose of angels in the first place. Look at Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 14. It says this, speaking of angels, we'll read verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits? sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. What's the purpose of an angel? They're created to minister unto those that would be saved. To man, right? So answer this question. Does it make sense that God created the angels and then thousands of years go by and then he creates man? When the whole purpose for the angel is to minister unto man. What are they doing for thousands of years? What's the reason? So yeah, he creates angels but then the whole reason why they're made and the whole purpose and their intentions is to minister, but he doesn't create the person that they're going to minister unto for another 5,000 years? Come on. It's ridiculous. It's just foolish. It makes no sense. Right? Obviously, yeah, you know, if he created the angels on, we're not told when, but if he created the angels on day one or day two, is it that big of a deal if he creates man on day six? When he, it went, so that four days go by while the angels are there? Is that the same as thousands of years going by? Of course not. We don't know when he created the angels. He could have created the angels right before he created man. We have no idea. We're not told when, right? So that's just, a, it makes no sense to say that they existed thousands of years before and then, you know, uh, you know, they went down and there's this pre-Adamic civilization and they, you know, uh, all, all this crazy stuff. You know what it is? It's sensationalism. It's trying to blow the Bible up and make it like a stinking sci-fi movie. I like the Bible how it is. I don't want your weird twists from Star Trek and all this stuff on the Word of God. I like it exactly how it is. Go to uh, Isaiah chapter number 14. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 14. Isaiah chapter number 14, here's their other teaching. They teach that, of course, like I said, that the angels were those that came and inhabited the earth and corrupted the earth. And they try to use this passage with Lucifer, and I'll show you exactly you know, what they say. And this is, of course, Isaiah 14 is a passage about Lucifer, about him falling, right? This is about him falling. So I want you to look at Isaiah 14. We'll look at verse 11 first. It says this, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. Pomp is like pride, right? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave in the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven? And it says, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nation? So it's talking about him being cut down to the ground, about him being fallen, right? Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. So, the reason why Satan fell is because Satan desired to be God. He wanted to be like God or he wanted to take God's position basically, right? Well, what they teach from this passage is they say, well, when this took place, they, they had to have, Lucifer had to have already been on the earth, right? So, because look at verse 13, when his sin actually took place. For thou hast said in thine heart, he says, I will ascend into heaven. So where is he located? Is he in heaven? Do you believe in the gap theory yet? Yeah. Right? 
He says he has to ascend into heaven, right? So he cannot be in heaven. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. So they say, see, he's not in heaven when this took place, right? So I would say two things. Number one, I would say that, yeah, that's possible. Now, do we know the amount of time that took place from when Adam and Eve were created and they sinned? We don't know, do we? So, what do angels do all throughout the Bible? Good angels, let's say that. They go from heaven to where? To earth? From earth to heaven. I mean, that's what Jacob's ladder is. They're just going up and down, right? They're constantly God sending angels. They're coming back. They're going. What are they doing all the time? What is the devil doing? Even now. Even as a fallen creature. Right? What's he doing? He, he, in in uh, Job 1, he present, it says there was a day where the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also. Do you know where he, he was there? Heaven. Do you know where he says he was prior to that? Where he tells God? God says, whence comest thou? He says, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Do you know what Satan's even doing as a fallen creature? Going back and forth. So, yes, that's possible. That when Satan actually fell, that he was on earth. When he actually sinned for the first time, he could have been on earth during the period of time prior to, or, or in between the time that man was created and Adam and Eve fell. Does that make perfect sense? Wouldn't that be a plausible answer? Would that, this is what they think, they think that now that they've proven that when he fell was actually on earth and not in heaven, therefore thousands of years be between Genesis chapter 1, 1 and 1, 2. What, are you, what is wrong with you? Use your brain. Use logic. I would agree with you that maybe he wasn't in heaven. That's possible. That is possible that maybe he wasn't in heaven when he made these statements. That's, that's totally possible. But number two, I want to show you something else that I, I don't want you to avoid. And this is very important in Scripture when you're reading. And this is going to be a very important uh, a method of interpretation when you're learning your Bibles. Because both passages of where we see Satan or Lucifer spoken of in the Old Testament, they are passages that are figuratively speaking of Satan. And they are figuratively speaking of Lucifer. Lucifer. And the primary application is actually a man. I want you to look at... Isaiah chapter number 14, verse number 4. Look at the context. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of what? Against the king of Babylon. Notice that. He's speaking about the king of Babylon. And then it goes on and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath. And it goes on and on and on. Look at verse, you can, I could easily prove the continuity between antecedents here that once we get to verse number 12, he's speaking of the same person. He refers to him as Lucifer in verse number 12, yes, but it's so clear. Look at verse 10. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Watch this. Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and thy noise in the vile. So notice. He was proud, he was up high, and then he's brought low, okay? Look at Isaiah 14, verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Same person, same context. Primarily, this passage, which is, I believe, prophetic of, Luc of Satan, because it sp clearly calls him Lucifer, is primarily applied to the king of Babylon. That's very plain and very clear. But it's definitely teaching, and, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the king of Babylon, which is the Antichrist, ultimately, in end times Babylon, but then he references him as Lucifer. Oh, Lucifer. Why? Because he could have been possessed by Lucifer. That would make perfect sense as well. But the primary application is he tells you clearly that he is speaking to the king of Babylon. And that man is obviously a wicked, evil man. And, if, and, and the further proof of that, if you keep reading, you can't just like like, uh, you know, partition these, want, these verses when there's clear continuity that continues on even after it's speaking right there quickly about Lucifer. So, of course, there's an application of Satan and of Lucifer there. But the overall text is not just about Satan. It's about the king of Babylon. He's taking up a proverb against the king of Babylon. Because he goes on, 
Look at verse 19. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under the feet. Now I'm going to prove it further to you. Look at verse 22. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. Who's he talking to? The king of Babylon. Yes. Lucifer and king of Babylon is like Lucifer and he throws in this nugget while he's speaking about Babylon. It's prophetic of Lucifer and it's of Lucifer, yes. And he gives you details about Lucifer, but it's also about the king of Babylon as well. So be careful how far you take every single little thing literal. Let me say that. Which I do believe that you can take this and say, hey, it makes perfect sense. That's my belief on the passage, right? That it's speaking about Lucifer when he sinned. Go to Ezekiel chapter 28. We'll see this again. Exact same thing. Both passages in the Old Testament that are the main passages about um, Lucifer. Let's hurry up real quick. I wanted this to be a quick, more Bible study, shorter sermon. Let's hurry up through this. But it's going to be the same exact thing. Ezekiel chapter number 28. Look at verse number 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus. Doesn't that sound identical? Proverb against the king of Babylon. Right now, lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. And say unto, them, unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the king of Tyrus. But of course... Has, has, has specifically the king of Tyrus been in Eden? In the garden of God? No. So could you make, uh, is, there a, is there definitely, not could you make, is there definitely a prophetic slant to this? But he's also speaking about the king of Tyrus. There's no way around that. Just literally the verse prior to that, he told you he's speaking of the king of Tyrus. Then it goes on. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, the barrel, the onyx and the jasper, the sapphire, emerald and carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Remember how I said that, that uh, it was paradise in the Garden of Eden and it will be restored back to that? Did you notice all of those uh, 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 metals and things that were mentioned there? Do you remember the foundations of the earth? That's... You know, they're tied in with one another because it's going to be restored back to that in paradise. Look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of, of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So they use this as a text as well, a proof text to say that, see, this had to have taken place before paradise. Well, this actually defeats their entire argument because it tells you that he was actually in the Garden of Eden and that he was perfect still during that time. So I don't know how you can try to use this passage to teach that you know he's in the Garden of Eden after he had already sinned because it's clear there's, there's an order of events that are taking place here. He's in the Garden of Eden and he's the anointed cherub and he's going back and forth and that makes perfect sense to me. And At one point he came and saw man he became envious, if you will, that man's ruling over the things that are on the earth. And he wanted to rule over man. And he wanted to be the one that's, that, that has power. And he wanted to rule over God. And he's just becoming envious everywhere. He's like, look at me, I'm stuck as an angel, right? And you know, at that point, he's like, I'm going to ascend up into heaven. That makes perfect sense to me. Logically, it makes sense that at one point when coming to Eden, that's when he sinned. Going back and forth, right? So, I don't even know how they try to use this passage. I'm losing steam here. Uh, my other point was going to be Revelation chapter number 12, comparing that to Daniel 12. One of the things that they really misunderstand is the point that I made before. That he is not actually cast out of heaven yet. This is one of their major misunderstandings. It's the same uh, problem that they have with the old earth, new earth, that they think it's an entirely new creation. They believe, like a lot of people, a lot of IFBs misunderstand this, that that. The devil has already been cast out and cannot even go to heaven. Well, that's not true because we know that from Job 1. We know that he is the accuser of the brethren day and night in Revelation. It's talking about those in the tribulation. So he's going back and forth. So their proof is, well, see, he, you know, he's still in heaven at this time while the garden, you know, uh, uh, that would be, that's debunking them. I don't even know how they could use this. But they try to use both these passages to say, see, he was on earth. That means he had already been cast out of heaven and he can't go to heaven, right? Because he's been cast out. Therefore, he must have been cast out prior to that. So, it's ridiculous logic. It doesn't even make sense. It's, 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 it's very foolish. We're going to end in 2 Corinthians 11 with the point that we began with. 
I love the Bible and I love it just how it is. I don't want people messing with it. I don't want people changing it. And I really don't like it when people make it sound ridiculous. There are people that I love that I believe are brethren. And I, and I love these people that believe this. I have family members that believe in the gap theory. The gap theory is stupid. I have tons of cousins. I have cousins that are pastors that believe and preach the gap theory. The gap theory is foolish. The Bible's not foolish. The gap theory is foolish. This sermon is the gap theory in light of the Bible, right? This, this sermon is, is, it was basically exhaustive, to be honest. I mean, they have other points, but I, I pretty much covered every single thing. It's, it's very close to being exhaustive. That's what exhaustive means, that I cover every single thing. Those are all their main points. It's, it's, the Bible is simple. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 1. Would to God you could bear with me in a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now when you really get down to it, the serpent beguiled Eve out of what? And away from what? What was her, uh, um, you know, what, what word am I looking for? What was her uh, bastion? What was her refuge? What did she have? What did you say? Her husband, nah, that's not what I'm looking for. What was, her, what was her refuge? What was keeping her from sinning? What was it? The Word of God. She was told the Word of God not to eat of that tree. Thou mayest freely eat of anything you want, right? But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou, thou shalt not eat of it, lest ye die. She quoted that to him. And then he deceived her out of the word of God. You know what Christ is? He's the word of God. You know, Eve was deceived out of the word of God. You know what they're being warned here? Don't be beguiled by Eve. It says from the simplicity which is in Christ. The majority of the Bible is simple. Really. The majority of the Bible is easy to understand and it's simple. And if you read it a lot, a lot of it's easy. There are hard things in the Bible, right? The Bible is a lot harder to put into practice than it is to actually understand. You know, it's way easier to understand than it is to put into practice. You know, transforming your life and changing your life and adding charity and virtue and knowledge and patience and hard work and diligence and all of these things to your life, that's a lot harder than understanding the Word of God. Genesis chapter 1 is not hard to understand. There is simp simplicity which is in Christ. There is simplicity in the Word of God. There is simplicity in the Bible. Right? We just need to believe the Bible how it is. I love the Bible just like it is. Don't try to add to it. Don't try to compromise it. Don't try to change it. Just hold on to it. Let's just believe the simple Word of God. The simple creation story. Six days God created this earth. Six days, and he rested on the seventh day, and it's as simple as that. And I don't care if some professor thinks I'm a fool. He's a fool. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you that we can have boldness and stand on your word and know that